All right. As I indicated before, this is going to be a makeup session where the sound was misbehaving and uh, we weren't able to get it mic'd and recorded correctly. Um, the other thing I indicated before is that this is going to be kind of a, a speed flight, flyover, whatever. It's going to be a warp speed um, fly through Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the warnings to the churches. Uh, as also indicated, we could easily spend one week per church um, in, in this uh, portion of the scriptures. But as the focus of this study is eschatology, um, I don't want to say that we're that the uh, all the practical aspects that can come out of studying Revelation chapters two and three are not important. They're very significant, and I would urge that that study. Um, we're going to throw some tidbits in your direction here, and I'm hoping that on your own you will uh, take the initiative and go in there and study deeper. We may at some time do another series, another study on the seven churches. There are many out there. Some are better than others. But uh, let's just take a look at um, what's going on here with with Revelation. And um, let's see here. I am going to I'm going to be fighting this a little bit here. I've got two screens, but it still wants to fight me. Um, as you can see, this is what we pointed out before in an, in an earlier map, a different map slightly. Here are the seven churches that are being addressed. They are Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Ephesus, and Laodicea. And what I really want to draw out of this is how that there is, um, in addition to um, practical warnings for each and every church today, there was also practical warnings for each and every one of these churches, and actually every church back in the first century. Um, there are a lot of churches here not mentioned. Jesus chose these particular seven churches for a reason. Uh, you will see that the church of Jerusalem is not on here. Colossae is not in here. Corinth is not on here. So these are particular churches and in a particular order that uh, Jesus wanted for a reason. And... Um, most um, futurist-minded Bible scholars will say that the reason why they're in this order is because they, as a pattern, kind of fit the pattern of where the church overall was headed through time, through history. And uh, there's some great arguments for that. Um, can't argue with the timing of that. Um, it does not necessarily apply to each and every church. Um, it, it, but as a, a main thrust of the church in uh, various eras, it fits pretty well. Now, there's some quibble over uh, what years these churches started transitioning and when they did not. Um, frankly, I, I think it's safe to say there's a lot of overlap. In other words, you have, you know, Pergamos and you have Thyatira coming in, and then the one kind of goes away, and the other one kind of moves into the foreground. So they kind of move that way, or they overlap a little bit. However you choose to look at it. So, let's see here, without further ado, let's go into this further. All 
All right. In the warnings to the churches, we see these seven churches, um, Smyrna in Philadelphia, Sardis and Laodicea, Ephesus, Pergamos, and Thyatira. And what we're going to look at is there is the good, Smyrna and Philadelphia. There are no warnings, um, no corrections from Jesus handed down to these particular churches. The bad, Sardis and Laodicea. The Lord had nothing good to say about those two churches. So when we see the warnings of the churches, Sardis and Laodicea was not bad. The ugly, <clears throat> really that's kind of uh, more than just Ephesus, Pergamos, and Thyatira. Uh, it's just a, a play on the funny word here because of the cultural reference to the movie. But uh, all churches have their faults, all have their flaws, all have some warnings offered to them. Um, the warnings also that um, you will see can really be applied to us as individuals as well. There's some cautionary tales to, to be careful of. And uh, that's really all the, the emphasis is. So what we see in, in history is we see um, what Jesus spoke to them about is the church at Ephesus fell out of love with Christ. Which is ironic because we have the, the letter where Paul was cautioning them some, you know, a, a couple, what, 40 years before, I guess. And um, no, not that long, not that long before. Um, probably more like, well, it could be about there. So, because like I say, there's some transition, there's some overlap going on there. So I mean, it didn't happen overnight. So in Ephesus, love is being spoken of um, quite thoroughly by Paul as a warning, as a caution in the letter. And uh, Paul told them what needed to happen for them to operate properly and display love within their church and yet they fell out of love anyway um, Smyrna um, they're the suffering persecuted church we see that in particular um, in uh, the early part of of the uh, first century and then moving forward and we'll get into we'll look at some of the years in a bit I believe I did show an earlier chart that kind of had some overlap there Pergamum was married to the world. There was a compromise going on there. And then the Thyatira, they tolerated false doctrine and they taught a social gospel. Sardis is the dead or zombie church. And then Philadelphia is the beautiful church. And Jesus had all kinds of great things to say about Philadelphia. And it's kind of... Um, overlaps quite a bit between the, the Sardis Church and Laodicea. I believe we see particularly Philadelphia and Laodicea now. Philadelphia is the faithful and true church. Meanwhile, you've got Laodicea, the apostate church where Satan dwells. Yes, Satan in the church. It's uh, neither hot or cold. It's a lukewarm church. It's not really a church at all. So we see a church today very much in compromise. Um, and what we have is uh, some of the greatest words of commendation, um, some of the clearest words of warning are here in these letters, and some of the most uplifting words of promise were spoken by Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor, um, as I said, there were a lot more churches than these seven churches, but the seven churches, there was a reason why. And here's some more references to seven in the book of Revelation. As you can see, there are many. Um, I'm not going to give all the references. I'll just run down the list in the interest of time. But we have seven churches, seven spirits, seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes. Seven angels who stand before God, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven thousand people killed, 
seven heads, seven crowns, seven angels, seven plagues, seven vials or bowls, seven mountains, and seven kings. And so those, those are kind of some examples. You see, it's the heptatic structure. Um, the book of Revelation is just replete. And if you dig and dig more, you'll see more patterns of, of uh, sevens and combinations as you uh, dig more deeply. And I suggest you keep an eye out for that as you go in. So beginning in chapter 2, we have the, the churches at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. So all the letters will be broken down into five sections. Um, there are charts you can uh, make that you can create. I'll show an example of one here that you can make for your studies. Um, one is how Jesus describes the recipient of a letter. And a, a second column you might put in would be how Jesus, the author, describes himself, how he portrays himself to this letter. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, but you'll see what I mean. Three is how Jesus commends the church. Four will be how Jesus warns and instructs the church. And then five, what Jesus says to those um, in those churches. Now, here's a, an example of a, a type of chart you might do. And um, reward for overcomers this is the last column. You can see they on the uh, left-hand side. All the different churches are listed in order. So we can make a chart like this. And it can be kind of fun. It could be a challenge. Um, it, it'll kind of set the tone for how you can compare the, the uh, seven churches. So to the church at Ephesus, there it is on the map. Not super important for our purposes here. Ephesus was the largest city in the Roman province of Asia Minor. Population of about 300,000. It was a well-situated seaport on the Adriatic Sea. It was the center of commerce. It was the center of worship to the pagan goddess Artemis, Diana, according to the Roman name. And there are some ruins there, present-day Ephesus. So we see in verse 1, to the angel or overseer of the church of Ephesus write. And here's how he presents himself. And all these letters fit this kind of a pattern. Um, the author, he says, the one, Jesus, in other words, who holds the seven stars. In other words, the messengers of the seven churches. He's the one who holds them in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lamps. And so here is hearkening back to, yeah, yeah, I'm that guy back there in chapter one, in the former chapter, um, the seven churches. And he says this, I know your deeds, your good works and toils, labors of love and perseverance in the Lord and that you cannot tell, tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they're not. And you found them to be false. Yet, this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Those are a couple of commendations. But then, um, also we have this. God knows the deeds of his church. He knows the good works we do. Remember, works are but the outer manifestation of our inner faith. Not to get saved, but because we are saved. He knows that we won't tolerate false doctrine and false prophets and apostles in our midst. Uh, more does he. So, ab about the whole thing about manifesting our faith and works are about the, uh, they're about the man outer manifestation of our inner faith. Remember Ephesians chapter 2, go back and read that. Um, and we find out that. Uh, uh, Faith is a gift. Grace is a fifth as is a gift. Uh, so grace and faith are gifts, and they're not of works, lest any man should boast. It's all the work of God that um, that brings us to salvation. But now here's the warnings and instructions to Ephesus. He says, um, verse four and five. But I have this against you that you have left your first love, your um, love of Jesus. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen what you've been saved from and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand or your church out of its place unless you repent. Ultimately, this is what happened, is it not? Now, Asia Minor is modern day Turkey. Um, there is not much, there's, there's an underground church there, but uh, the church at Ephesus um, is, well, you saw the pictures of the ruins that we were just looking there. 
So uh, we've lost our first love if we do not daily die to self and live for him. This is in Luke 9, 23 and 24. We forget where we came from. We were all dead in our sins if in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. Uh, we forget what he has done for us and forget what we now need to do for him. He will not be mocked. We reap whatever we sow. Galatians 6, 7. But his letter in Ephesus, his, uh, the promised overcomers in verse 7, is he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes or is conquering, excuse me, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So if we persevere and don't give up and daily overcome the flesh through living by his spirit, Romans 8, 12, then we will inherit the kingdom of God. We who overcome this world and will enjoy the fruit of the tree of life that is in heaven. And then the church is Smyrna. We're going to hit all these, like I said, quickly, and then we'll kind of work, we'll kind of look at an overview of them. Um, Smyrna had a superb deep harbor on the Adriatic Sea, making it an important commercial center. It called itself the first city of Asia. It built temples to Emperor Tiberius. The city became a center for cult emperor worship. It is known today as Izmir. And there's ruins at present-day Smyrna. And the letter to the Church of Smyrna, the recipient, and uh, verse 8, the first part says, And to the angel or overseer of the Church of Smyrna, right? Here's how Jesus presents himself, the first and the last. He who was dead and has come to life says this. So uh, that part of Tom might have been into emperor worship. He's presenting himself as... Uh, the first and the last. He's the be-all and end-all. He's the beginning and the end, right? No emperor can claim that. And um, he was dead and he's come to life. No Emperor dies, they die. They get replaced by another. So Jesus is presented in a, in a unique way. So Jesus was the first and he will be the last. He was dead but was alive. He's the firstborn or the preeminent one among many to be in heaven. So the commendation, he said, I, Jesus, know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich because our riches aren't in what we have in this world, right? Even if we're undergoing persecution, God knows the trials and tribulations and the poverty of spirit that we are presently going through. He knows our burdens, but he also says that we are not poor at all, but are rich in him, Philippians 5.19. Why do we continue to measure our wealth by our possessions? This is kind of a problem today, isn't it? Especially here in the Western culture that we enjoy here in the United States. So that are the churches sworn to the warnings and instructions we have in, in verse 9b all the way through 10. And I know the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. That means it's a colloquial, colloquialism. That is, a, or it's a Hebraism. 10 days is a Hebraism for a short amount of time. Be faithful and I will give you the crown of life. So, emperors, crowns, will get a crown. It will be a crown of life. I think it's interesting. Um, uh, he mentions the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And so, we kind of had this with uh, the Judaizers back in the first century. The Judaizers are back. We have not everybody in the movement, but there's partic are, um, particularly aggressive movements, the sacred name movement, the Hebrew roots movements, and there are a couple of those, and they butt heads and they fight. Sacred name is they bicker back and forth about 
how you pronounce the name of Jesus or Yeshua or Yahshua or Yeheshua or pick one. And they'll fight over the proper way to say it. And if you don't pronounce it right, you're not going to heaven. That's strictly devilish. Where do you find that in Scripture? There's no way to justify that. That's a cult. But they call themselves Jews. They're not really Jews. Most of them are, you know, as uh, Gentile as I am. And probably most of you. So it's uh, utter nonsense. So they had the same kind of problem back then telling them, you know, you got to keep to the law. You got to keep to this. You got to do this a certain way. You got to say this a certain way. And it's kind of funny because, you know, most of them are breaking the Levitical laws. I mean, are you wearing a poly blend right now? A cotton polyester blend? That's against the Levitical laws. Um, are you a Gentile, really, by blood, but yet you're, you're celebrating the Passover? Did you know that's for forbidden in the Old Testament? Unless you are an honored guest of a, a Hebrew family, uh, you're not permitted uh, under Mosaic law. Of course, now we're under grace in the church, and we can celebrate or not as we want, um, but it, it gets crazy. And then also the Sabbaths. Is the Sabbath is it on the the seventh day, and you're going to keep it on the seventh day. That's kind of funny because the calendar of the days of the week were changed during the Council of Nicaea. Um, our calendar of the days of the week are off by three days right now. So in other words, if you want to celebrate, you or you want to, or you even you want, might not want to call it celebrate, you want to honor the Sabbath, and you want to keep the Sabbath because it's a holy day, you want to keep the same Sabbath that the Jews kept during the first century and second century of third, going up to the Council of Nicaea, all the way back to the times of Moses, uh, you would have to do that today on a Tuesday because our calendar is off by three days. Oops. So if you're going to follow the law, you're condemned already. We're under grace. We're not under the law. But anyway, I digress. This is what I said I wouldn't do. Okay, so God knows there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Same thing I was just talking about. Amongst our brothers and sisters, even in the church, God also knows there are those who call themselves Christians but are really workers of Satan and other sects and cults in our community. Uh, not just the Hebrew roots or sacred name, but um, there are many who uh, claim to follow the scripture who do not, whether they're Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons, but there are many. Um, but many who call themselves Christians and um, they uh, honor the scripture with their lips, but they don't really follow it. Um, many of, the, of them today are very worldly and call themselves Christians and show up on PBN, um, but they're not really true followers. So seek out those who seek to destroy our society by their satanic beliefs, their immoral lifestyles and actions bring life to them through the gospel. The promised overcomers is he who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. You might fall into persecution. Many of us do, even now, in various places in the world. But we will not be hurt by the second death. That's when we're given life. Eternal life, that's when we get to enjoy it. Right? We get our glorified bodies, and uh, so we are with the Lord forever. So if we persevere and don't give up and daily overcome our flesh and live by His Spirit and His grace and His power, then we will, we will not be cast into the lake of fire and will not be affected by God's judgment to death. Called the second death in Revelation 21.8. But rather His call to eternal life with Him in New Jerusalem. And there's much about that. In Revelation 21, and, and also through, uh, also at uh, New Jerusalem is uh, there's a lot of that in chapter 22 of Revelation as well. Pergamum, being there it is on the map. Uh, had the second largest library of all time. Time it became the capital of the Rome. It became the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was the site of the pagan temple to. Ascalops, god of medicine and healing. Um, and there's a huge statue of Zeus 
and temples of Athena and many other gods there in um, Pergamon. There are some ruins there to present in, uh, in present day Pergamum. To the recipient, the, or the recipient is, and to the angel overseer at the church of Pergamum, of course, just like the other ones say, here's how Christ presents himself. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. So they might be all about medicine um, in uh, this town. That might be their center of commerce. But here he's got a two-edged sword words that cut so you might need a doctor by the time you're done um jesus holds all truth through the sword of his spirit and his sword hebrews uh ephesians 6 uh, verse 16 and 17 says in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then look at Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and concerning the thoughts and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from, its, from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So, the letter of the Church of Pergamum, the commendation is, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now, this is, uh, to this letter, this is the first really significant letter I want to point out that dates the book of Revelation. Why? Antipas, my witness, he was a martyr. Um, Jesus is mentioning this. Uh, Antipas was martyred in, during the time of Domitian. This is well after 70 AD. This is um, approximately about 85 AD or so when Antipas was killed. And this is according to uh, several sources. So most historians and Bible scholars will say, yeah, about 85 or so AD um, during the reign of Domitian was when Antipas uh, was killed. Now, the reason why this is important is because um, many folks, um, pr predominantly the um, amillennial crowd would like to push the date of the book of Revelation back um, before 70 AD because that would make life a lot more convenient for how to interpret some of the scriptures or reinterpret some of the scriptures the way they prefer. So what they like to do is try to redate the book of Revelation in a way that makes it a lot more convenient for them. But then there's little things like this that make it very troublesome for them. Okay, so that dates the book. And about 95 AD is when most historians say that um, it, John was on Patmos to write this book. So the warnings and instructions, but I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you have some who, in the same way, hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, or else I'm, I'm coming to you quickly, um, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, the word quickly there. Um, a lot of people will point to the book of Revelation and other passages where uh, the Lord says he's coming quickly. And they, they uh, um, say, see, they thought the Lord was coming back even back in those days. Well, the word quickly in our English doesn't really come across with this word. A better way to translate this is uh, a suddenly or rapidly. 
uh, ACOS is where we get our word for tachometer, and it's the gauge in the car that uh, that will measure the the RPMs of the engine. It'll rev up and it'll happen quickly. So Jesus is threatening, I'm going to come on to you quickly. So he's not saying, uh, I'm going to come on to you soon, um, as in other passages where the word soon might be tacos as well. So you have to look at the those words quickly and soon and find out which ones they are and find out according to context uh, how it ought to be translated. But he's talking about coming up on them rapidly. <clears throat> God knows that there are amongst us those who would try to put stumbling blocks in front of us, even in the name of religion, and if we allow them to continue to operate in our midst, he will come with his word and pierce them. There is pressure to compromise and conform to this world's values and systems, but we must repent. Again, sorry folks, I'd love to go into some of the history of some of this, because it's rich, but um, why don't you? Get a good Bible dictionary, Bible encyclopedia, what have you. Um, so, letter to the Church of Pergamum, the promise to overcomers is, verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden, hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. There's so much to go into here. But it's a neat promise. Songs have been written about it and so forth. And it's just it's just kind of a humbling thing that God has a special name for each one of us. And he's going to give us a white stone with our own private name that he has for us. The first manna, Psalm 78, 24, sustained the children of Israel in the wilderness. And his new manna, his word, will sustain us today. His hidden manna that was in the tabernacle, Hebrews 9, 4, is also our spiritual manna in Christ. The new name will be written on it, Isaiah 62, 2, written in the book of life that only the receiver knows. Ah, I hate to cut this short. The best meaning of a white stone probably has to do with the ancient Roman custom of awarding white stones to the victors of athletic games. The winner of a contest was awarded a white stone with his name inscribed on it. This served as his ticket to a special awards banquet. According to this view, Jesus promises the overcomers entrance into the eternal victory celebration in heaven. The new name most likely refers to the Holy Spirit's work of conforming believers to the holiness of Christ. See Romans 8.29 and also, also Colossians 3.10. Thyatira, motoring through, not quickly enough. It was a smaller city, but a thriving manufacturing and commercial center, many trades and guilds. It was steeped in suspicion and pagan rituals. The era for this church falls right into where uh, the Roman Catholic Church in particular was very strong and growing and flourishing. Um, it accepted many cults and tradesmen's secret societies, which you will note probably the uh, similarities between the Catholic Mass and, for instance, the Masonic Lodge and other lodges. Um, there are a lot of overlap. A woman called Jezebel taught and fooled many Christians to conform to paganism. So you have Jezebel and uh, statues of Jezebel that were, were mother and child. Um, that's more history we could get into. And unfortunately, we are not going to take the time to do that now. But it's sobering, and it should be. Uh, the recipient and to the angel or overseer of the Church of Thyatira, right? Here's how he presents himself as the author, the son of God, right? Not the son of Mary or the son of anyone else. The son of God is who he is, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. Okay, so now here's presenting himself as judge. 
So anyway, the commendation, let's look at the commendation quickly here in verse 19. I know your works. Notice this. I know your works, your love and faith and service, patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So works is mentioned here a couple times. So the Roman Catholic tradition is a very works-oriented tradition. So he's saying, I know this, I've seen this. Here's the warning, verses 20 to 22. Okay, picking up from two slides ago. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, in looking at this as the Catholic Church, no one is trying to say that, that Mary is Jezebel. What it is, is it's a false religious system that puts somebody else, in this case, another another woman, um, as um, predominant or preeminent in their church and venerated highly. Uh, and it detracts away from Christ. So in that way, their Roman worship is like Jezebel in that regard. It's not, that's not the real Mary. The real Mary would come down here and um, have a lot of scolding to do uh, if she walked into the Roman Catholic Church today. She would have some stern words. Um, but anyway, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bond servants or all my slaves uh, astray so that they may commit acts of immorality and eating sacrifice to idols. So there's a lot of veneration of, of uh, statues and things around there, lighting candles and incense to statues. So there's a lot of idol worship going on and the Mary statues. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Well, we won't even go into all of that. But there's a lot of history there as well and a lot of similarities if you think about it. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her to great tribulation. And why is it mentioned great tribulation here? Uh, the Catholic Church, the, the Church of Thyatira was a long time ago. Well, here's where we start seeing a lot of overlap where there's a lot of who follow the, the tradition of Thyatira, the Roman Catholic Church, into the very end and into the tribulation. So we've got about three different churches here, at least now that kind of uh, overflow and stack into uh, some overlap going into the tribulation toward the very end of time here unless they repent of their deeds. Um, more warnings and instructions, and I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. So if you're going to follow or live on and try to exist and try to get into heaven by your deeds, by your own deeds, you're going to get what's coming to you. No, I want to get to heaven on Christ's deeds and have his righteousness imputed unto me. Not try to get to heaven on my own righteousness, my own deeds, God forbid, because I'm not righteous at all on my own. Because I do good things once in a while does not in any way make me righteous. So you want to get to heaven based on the blood of Christ shed for your sins and um, his work on the cross and the righteous way that he lived in your behalf. That's the only way to get into heaven. So, letter of the Church of Thyatira, more commendations in verses 24 and 25. He says, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, there are some believers in the Roman Catholic Church, you need to get out. And I tend to think that those who are in there, the Holy Spirit is probably bugging you or will bug you at some point and show you some things won't quite jive with scriptures um, and you need to follow the Holy Spirit's lead as he's bugging you and get out. Um, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. I have placed no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. You, know, you've, um, you don't have a lot a lot right now you've got you're in the wrong church wrong faith wrong worship that you need to get out um, and and hold on till it comes Jesus will commend us for walking in his word not the Pope's word okay um, 
1 John 2, 4 to 6, and not seeking after the winds of this world, even though religiosity or signs and wonders, or even through religiosity or signs and wonders, if they don't glorify Jesus. Uh, the promise to overcomers, and he who overcomes and keeps my works, keep Christ's works, not your own, until the end to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, says Christ, and he'll be sitting on the throne of David in the kingdom. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So it's interesting that he's talking about how Jesus is going to rule, rule from the throne with a pot of iron, with a rod of iron, I'm sorry. Um, because when Gabriel came to Mary, what did he promise her? That her son was going to sit on David's throne and rule. So there's another connection there. There are more, again. So then we get into chapter 3. My motor again, not fast enough. Bing, there's the little happy church at Sardis. Um, all right. Sardis was the capital city of Lydia, about 80 kilometers from Smyrna. It was well fortified and not easily conquered. It became an important Christian center, but it relied on past glories and became complacent and died. Um, a lot of people will say this is a lot like some of the, the Reformed Church uh, 500 years ago. And um, in that way, a lot of people can um, kind of, as, it, as the Pharisees did in Jesus' day, kind of rest on their laurels. We're, we're of our father Abraham, you know, kind of thing. You know, we're Reformed, you know. We're, you know, of, uh, you know, all the Reformers that started during the Reformation, and we rest in those traditions. So, hey, we're good. Um, this is kind of what happened to um, Astartes after a fashion. So it's to the angel who oversees the church of, Ritus, of, of Sardis and Ace. He says, um, he presents himself, Jesus, as he who has the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven star says this. Now the seven spirits, this is an entirely different study. Um, most will point to Isaiah and seven again is that number of perfect completion. And so he's presenting himself as, hey, he's the only one who's complete. You might think you're reformed and you might think that you are complete. Your theology is good. You're done. No, you probably need to keep reforming. The only one who's complete is Christ. None of us are quite complete yet. Okay. We all need to continue reforming. Uh, we don't just look back and say, hey. We're done. I'm reformed. I'm good. Um, because, you know, I, I'm adding for reformed. Um, uh, a lot of reformed people will tell me I'm not because I hold to some dispensational views. And dispensational people will say, you're reformed, dude. Uh, so I, I don't have a home, <laughs> apparently. Uh, nobody wants me. But there are a lot of us that are out there that are like that. But, um, Sometimes uh, there can be a little bit of, of cockiness in um, the reform camp and, and feeling like, hey, we've got this doctrine thing down. Can't touch this. Uh, don't be like that. Um, if you're in the cage stage, get out of the cage. Pour a sip of coffee, relax. So the commendation is I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive. As before, God knows our, does know our deeds that are done in his name for his glory. He knows that some churches are indeed alive, but here's some warning and instructions. But you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it. Repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, don't be asleep anymore. Don't slumber. If you don't wake up, I'll come like a thief. And you'll not know the hour I'll come to you. And there's a lot of controversy. It's funny among the, the Reformed folks about what it means about coming like a thief. 
Well, when he talks about coming like a thief, um, he's coming like a thief to the unsaved, unbelievers. Um, hopefully you're saved. Hopefully you're a believer. Uh, we're not going to be caught like a, a, unaware like a thief in the night. Jesus, when he said this in um, the Olivet Discourse, um, as in the days of Noah, it were, was the world that was caught off guard like a thief. Noah was prepared. He didn't know the day or the hour. He knew the season. He had an ark. I think Noah had a hint when God started walking the animals two by two out of the ark, and he started going, ooh, hey, I see some clouds up over there. Okay? Um, many of us are dead. There's so much more I could have said about that back there, but I won't. Many of us are dead spiritually. We are asleep spiritually in need waking up. Jesus knows what has not been completed in our personal lives, in our community, and in our churches. If we do not complete, keep reforming. If we do not complete what he has called us to do and to be, then he, he will come unrepentantly. And uh, it will be too late. Um, but listen, if you're a believer, you're a believer. No one's, you're not going to go to hell for that. But we all like the idea of awards, awards that we will eventually place before the feet of Christ. But uh, you know, we don't want to give him peanut shells. We should be about his work. More commendations in verse 4. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The good news is that there are some, Jesus says a few, a remnant, here whose hearts are after the Lord and are continuing. In other words, they're not resting on their laurels or the, the crowd they hang with of the camp or the, the people that they're associated with. They're associating themselves with the Lord. Their hearts are inclined to the Lord. They have repented of their sins and have not fallen back and will walk in white garments with the Lord. Walk in purity. The promise to overcomers is this, in verses 5 to 6. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. That's his promise. He's promised this, right? Your name is there. Your name is there. He's not going to erase anybody out of there. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this is one that's very important. And this is one of the ones uh, I wanted to get at most quickly. Very controversial because this is one of the final churches. See, church number six out of seven churches. <clears throat> This is the modern pure church today, which includes people from Sardis, includes a remnant, small remnant from Thyatira, um, but the Church of Philadelphia. Being there it is, that dot right there, you are here. Um, the name means the city of brotherly love. It was a city in the province of Lydia, like Sardis was. It was the center of the wine industry. Right, let's, let's get into this because this is very important here. Um, okay, the author, he presents himself this way in 18b. He who is holy, who is true, and who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open, says this. So God is presented as sovereign. The sovereignty of God is very much disputed these days. Apparently, man is sovereign in a lot of churches. It is man whose will is being done, and God is reacting to man's will. But here he's presenting himself as uh, he's the one who opens and shuts in, not we men. It's the sovereignty of God that is in question today. Amen? So the commendation is, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan. Ooh, the synagogue of Satan is back again. Like the Hebrew roots people, it's back again. Weird. Who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Not works oriented people. Jesus has already put before us doors in our churches and communities. Sometimes we fail to open those doors that he wants open and instead close doors to the Holy Spirit. And conversely, we sometimes close doors that he wants open. We need to seek his word for every door we come to. I think that might be oversimplified, but Commendations continued, verses 10 and 11. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming quickly, hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Okay, wake up now. I want everybody to wake up. Eyes right here. Eyes right there, that way, okay? Very important, okay? I'm going to take myself out of the picture. You'll thank me later. You might be thanking me now, okay? Note this. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These things says he who is holy, he who is true, true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. And I'm telling you this is about the rapture and I will prove it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those things of the synagogue of uh, Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved you. Now listen here. Verse 10. Very important. Because. What? You've kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you. From the hour of trial. Which shall come upon the whole world. To test those who dwell on the earth. Riddle me this Batman. How is God going to keep. We saints from the hour of trial or tribulation same word which is going to come upon the whole world how is he going to keep us from that so it's to test who those who dwell on the earth the earth dwellers as opposed to what us so if we're not dwelling on the earth where are we on the moon okay let's look at it again because you have kept my command to persevere i will keep you from the hour of tribulation, which shall come upon the whole world. So the hour of tribulation is coming upon the whole world to test who? Those who dwell on the earth. In other words, you're not going to be dwelling on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And again, there's that word. It, it'll be rapidly. It'll be suddenly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take a crown. He overcomes. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of God and the name of the city of my God. What is the city of my, my God? It's the new Jerusalem, right? Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. My father's mansion are many rooms. And then he says that once that all happens, we're going to dwell with him and we'll never be separated again comes down out of heaven, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, the churches. Now, some people will say, oh, wait, 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 wait. You know, this is going to be as in the days of Noah. So what are you saying? God's going to make a giant ark? I, I got another verse here. Let's let's look at this here. Not another verse, another slide here. I want to see if it will go. <clears throat> and here it is. The promise of Revelation 3.10 now, there are several ways to say um, that um, people will say, I should say, how God is going to keep people out of the world in this trial that comes upon the whole world. The word where he says he's going to keep us out in Revelation 3.10 is the same thing 
as 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Terio et keep out. Keep out. So it's not, I'm going to take you out. Ario, uh, Ario ek. I'm not going to take you out. Ario apo, or take you from it. In other words, put you in someplace else on the earth. Uh, so you're not going to be going in it, Ario ek, and then he's going to at some point take you out of it, lift you out of it. It's not going to be Ario apo, take you from it, like to some island paradise or whatever. It's not terio in, it's not going to, in other words, I'm not going to keep you in it. It's not terio dia or keep you through it. It's terio ek, keep you out of it. Okay, so again, verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of tribulation, or trial, which shall come quickly upon the world to test who? Those who dwell on the earth. In other words, we're not going to be dwelling on the earth. I hope to make that really clear because that's a wrath thing. Let's look at, since we're here, and it says 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, I think it's important to look at this. Because what does it say? Okay, now here I'm cracking open a new King James. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even as God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, for if we throw you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who died. Why? Verse 16. Because, or for, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with this shout, there's that door, that he opens and no one can shut, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And what happens? Those who are who have died or gone to sleep, those who've died, um, in Christ will raise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's the word rapture. Caught up. Harpazo. Harpazo is the Greek. Uh, rapture, it comes from the Latin Vulgate. We'll be caught up or raptured together, taken with them, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice it's not a complete second coming all the way down. This fits the Hebrew wedding tradition that we go into later in this study. We meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We pause here. Okay, there's another thing I want to say about this whole wrath thing, and we see wrath in Revelation chapter 6. Notice this trial is going to come upon the whole world. This is the day of the Lord also. We read in um, Peter, for instance, and um, this is a whole broad study we can get into, but um, suffice to say as we get into, we're going to see wrath beginning in the seals in Revelation chapter 6. That means that is when the judgment of God is falling on the earth. And uh, I want you to recall as well that Jesus would, said that it would be as in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And usually people say, well, the days of Noah, I get the idea the whole world's going to be wiped out, but judgment was saved. He was kind of saved through it. So the church, um, you know, it was more like a teriodia right, the ark kind of thing, but that's more Israel. 
because the 70th week of Daniel is known in Jeremiah as the time of Jacob's or Israel's trouble. So, no, we we are taken out of it. We are perio ek, um, just like Enoch taken up to be with the Lord before the flood happened. But there's another thing he says, and that's and Lot. Jesus says it's like Lot. What happened to Lot? In, uh, to Lot, and um, we we read in Genesis that what happened was is the Lord. Lord came down to talk to Abraham. This is Reader's Digest condensed version, and said, "Yeah, we're kind of about to go nuke that town." And Abraham was going, "Well, uh, Lot's there. I, I need to. I got people over there. But what about them?" So uh, he's concerned, and and these and there starts this kind of a, a little bit of a word game, where Abraham's kind of saying, "Well, Lord, tell me, you know, how how's." He wants to know how safe his family is, how safe Lot and his family are. He says, uh, it would, if there's 50 righteous people there, are you still going to wipe it out? And he goes, uh, he says, no. He says, I, I won't wipe it, wipe it out if there's 50. He goes, okay, but um, what, what about 40? What about 30? What about, you know, and he goes all the way down. What about 10? 10, Lord, will you wipe out um, Sodom? If there's if there's 10 righteous people, he goes, I, know, I won't even wipe it out if there's 10 righteous people there. So, Lo and behold, uh, Abraham goes with with uh, the angel of the Lord and the, the two other angels. They go there to Sodom, and they're there for about a day. All kinds of things take place. Some horrific things take place. Um, but cutting to the chase is uh, the Lord says to uh, Lot, Hey, buddy, we got to get out. You got to get out now. And he goes, well, I kind of don't want to. Can I go over to this town instead? And the Lord's like, fine, but you got to get out. And you got to get out now because I can't nuke this place. I can't rain fire from heaven, brimstone from heaven, until you are out of the way. So God will not rain wrath upon the righteous. And Lot was accounted righteous. Abraham was accounted righteous as righteous we see in scripture uh, we also see in uh, Hebrews 11 so anybody who is the Lord's God is not going to pour his wrath out on them we the church are the bride of Christ so do you really suppose that we're going to go through tribulation and the Lord is going to rain fire down on us doesn't really pass the smell test Okay, doesn't really fit. Uh, continuing on with Philadelphia, there are no warnings for the church of Philadelphia. They're faithful. Because we may have no warnings now, we're still urged to keep on persevering. We are still urged to keep his word because we will be tested. We do have testing every day, not the great tribulation, not testing from God that includes wrath. We do go through trials and tribulations, and we've been told by Jesus that if we follow him, everybody is going to go through some level of trial and testing. Some people will go through much worse, right? The promised overcomer says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'll note one thing, and that is we have, beginning in Ezekiel 40, we have a temple. There are eight chapters go into great detail on, on a temple that is on the earth. New Jerusalem comes down, and the Bible says there's no temple in it. So the promise again to the saints at Philadelphia, to that church, is the promise to overcomers is, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When... John is 
taken up by the angel in Revelation 21, and he is shown the city, New Jerusalem. It is announced this way. Uh, the angel says, Behold the bride, now wife. Because um, places are often identified with those who dwell. If somebody says, Heaven knows, what you're saying is you're saying God knows. Heaven is a, as a, as a place any more than a building like New Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's a place, but it doesn't know anything. No, heaven knows because God knows, and heaven is identified with God because it's his dwelling place. New Jerusalem is identified with us, the bride of Christ, the church, because um, uh, um, it, it is where we dwell. Okay, it's Church at Laodicea. And there's Laodicea. Many, many sermons have been preached, some of them incorrectly. Sometimes you will see a, a Jesus painting where he's at a little stone house and he's knocking on the door. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, and it's we're supposed to take that as being, for instance, like uh, you know, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. And that is it's not the case. Jesus is on the outside of the church at Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the worldly church, and he's saying, let me in. I'm outside. You need to let me in. So it was economically prosperous and of high social prestige, you know, like a mega church kind of a thing. So very prestigious. It was destroyed in an earthquake in 60 AD, but it refused aid from Rome. So it was very prideful. We got this. We don't need your help. It was known for its black wool garments, water carried by aqueducts and barrel pipes was warmed on its long journey. The church considered itself self-sufficient. And there's the ruins at present day of Laodicea. Uh, it's to the angel of the church of Laodicea. The author, Jesus, presents himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So the way he presents himself shows what he thinks of Laodicea, who um, is not being a true witness. They are a false church. And that's what we see now. And they are not faithful, not faithful to the word of God. We have all the um, name it and claim it type stuff and so-called apostles and so forth. There are, no, there, are, there are no apostles today. There's nobody around who's 2,000 years old. The requirements for an apostle are stated quite clearly in Acts chapter 1. If you're a witness um, and you are around from the time of the baptism of John, and you weren't, and you saw the resurrected Christ, and you didn't. Those were some of the requirements. And there are about six or seven different requirements at least there if you read through carefully and you break it down in, in Acts chapter 1. But everybody's all about the prestige and their false witnesses with false promises, and it's a false church. And uh, you need to come out from, from that bunch. So these are three new names of Jesus not seen before. There's no doubt of who he is and should be in our lives. So the combination is, is I know your deeds. Hey, we do a lot of good stuff. You know, we sent airplanes to take Aquafina to somebody overseas or whatever. <clears> or <throat> rescue people. So Jesus says, we know your deeds. Jesus does not have anything positive to say about the church other than that. Um, you know, you've done some deeds. They probably sent Aquafina over to Afghanistan because, you know, it makes for good press and it brings more people in and gets people to open up their wallets some more, right? Um, it's marketing, a marketing ploy. So the warning is an instruction. So second part of verse 15 all the way through 17, he says, you, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I, I wish that you were 
cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy, and I'm naming it and claim it, right? I have no need of, I have no need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Uh, more warnings and instructions says, I advise you, verse 18, to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich in white garments, purity, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness <coughs> excuse me, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Um, an eye salve or ointment or cream to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Um, Much from history could be said uh, on this topic of Laodicea. There have a lot of a lot of rich history in there that we could go into again in the interest of time. Um, verse nineteen and twenty: Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Do you have discipline in your life? Is the Lord scolding you if you go through life and everything's la di da? You got to question whether you're really His, because if you're a child, your parent will discipline you when you're naughty, okay? Um, Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Jesus is not even in these false churches today that we see so prevalent. The promise to overcomers is this. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, these are some of the most powerful words spoken by Christ. They are the call to us to come to him regardless of our condition. We are invited to sit down with Christ on his throne. So the 13 rewards for the overcomer. Um, authority over the nations, name not erased from the book of life, inherits the earth, new name on a white stone, eat of hidden manna, pillar in a temple, sits on Christ's throne, free of life, not hurt by second death, um, the morning star, white garments, name of God, city, New Jerusalem, and Christ written on him, name confessed before the Father and his angels. So that's remarkable. Um, as I say, that was we've gone a little bit over. I don't know if I'll be able to trim this down to an hour or not, but we've gone a little bit over, but two chapters to go through and a lot to cover. But primarily, I wanted you to see the martyr that died in about 85 AD, a good 15 years after 70 AD when Jerusalem was sacked. And then we also have uh, the important Greek to go into in the language in Revelation 3.10 to show that uh, we will not see wrath that's coming upon the whole, whole earth. So there is a rapture. Harpazo. How do we get out? You know, what is God, is, you know, if, and it's going to come on those who dwell on the earth. Are we still going to be dwelling on the earth? So it's future, a future tribulation that comes. It's described in Revelation. And it's coming on those who dwell on the earth, not those who no longer dwell on the earth. Because a door has been opened that no one else can shut. So anyway, that's it. And now we move on.